Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Ryan Spencer. I'm the executive director here at the Smithfield Preston Foundation. And I'd like to welcome you to the very first of our Smithfield seminar series. And we're going to be talking tonight about commemoration and denial, how we choose to remember racism and slavery impacts and shapes our world today. And we're live from Preston Smithfield, a national historic site surrounded by Virginia Tech. And I might add to our, uh, to our Hokies listening, this is arguably the birthplace of Virginia Tech because one of its earliest founders was born here in this house. So why do we choose to talk about this topic at a historic site? Well, I believe that historic sites help us gain perspective from the past. They help us have insight for the present and inspiration for the future. Historic sites help us see things from other people's perspectives. And when that happens, we have empathy and when we have empathy, we're able to understand things that we previously were unable to see or understand. So rather than fight, we can discuss. And one thing we certainly need today is an ability to have empathy and to discuss. We might not always get it right. And in this conversation, I'm sure we're going to say something that somebody disagrees with, or we might even disagree with one another. But that's OK, because places like Smithfield must be a safe place for unsafe ideas. It has to be a place where we can come together and discuss challenging and dangerous things. And this house is perfect for this type of discussion because here, very prominent people debated about important things like the American Revolution. They debated independence and abolition, education and freedom. But these amazing topics and ideas were discussed by deeply flawed people. Just like you and I are incredibly deeply thought, flawed, there are things we love about ourselves and there are things we hate about ourselves at the same time. So while these, these individuals who are here in this house debated lofty things like freedom and independence, they also live in a society that allowed them to own other people. Here, over 200 people lived, worked, and often died enslaved and subjugated. This is really difficult for us to come to terms with. This is very heavy stuff. And today, we are still experiencing the repercussions of that fact. There were people, a whole race of people, who were allowed to be subjugated and forced to work. Our choice is often to celebrate this period of history or deny that anything bad ever happened. That's often been the easiest path to take. But that's not what we're choosing to do tonight. Tonight we'll discuss how to remember this history, and we'll discuss how it shapes our world today. And with me, I have three esteemed panelists. To my right is Dr. Ellington Graves. Dr. Ellington Graves has his bachelor's degree from John Hopkins in sociology. He has his master's from right here in Blacksburg at Virginia Tech. And he has his PhD at North Carolina at Chapel Hill in sociology. Dr. Graves has been working at Virginia Tech since 2000, and he's been the head of Africana Studies since 2012. And he is currently the Assistant Vice Proto Provost for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. And it's his responsibility to help increase faculty diversity, enhance research, support, campus planning, and student achievement. To the right of Dr. Graves, we have Dr. Kara mosley Haas. Dr. Mosley Hobbs works in Washington, D.C. in on educational policy, on regulation, research, and experimental learning. Her focus is on African American history. And just to give you an idea of who she is, she made her first publication when she was 12 years old. Kara is also a descendant of John Fraction, who was enslaved here at Smithfield, and she serves on the board of directors for the Smithfield Preston Foundation, and as somebody I'm very pleased to count as a colleague. She has authored More Than a Fraction, which is a fictional work that takes place here at Smithfield and in neighboring solitude. To the right of Kara, we have Dr. Dan Thorpe. Dr. Thorpe is Associate Professor of History, and he is also the Associate Dean of undergrad academic affairs at Virginia Tech. He's received numerous awards, including favorite faculty, 
He received the award for teaching excellence. He's been the teacher of the week, and the list goes on. He is clearly a well-liked professor at Virginia Tech. And he's also the author of Facing Freedom, an African-American community in Virginia, from Reconstruction to Jim Crow. And Dr. Thorpe also sits on Smithfield Preston Foundation's Board of Directors, and is something I'm very pleased to count as a colleague. So we will take a few moments and hear from each of our panelists. Afterwards, we'll have plenty of time for questions, and we'll try to answer as many of those as we can. But I'll turn the table over to Dr. Graves. Thank you, Ryan. So the, the, the juxtaposition we were given for tonight, commemoration or denial, I think is a really, it, it's, it's obviously where we start, but I think to, to, to understand how those two concepts interplay, I think is really important and we'll, we'll kind of begin um, sort of the, the trajectory of my comments. Commemoration can be understood as just an intentional effort to uh, um, you know, to remind us, to, to allow us to hold on to collective memory. But in many instances, that, that's the denotation, the connotation is celebration. And I think one of the things that's really important for us to, to, to recognize is that in the context of this conversation about the plantations uh, and enslavement, that celebration requires denial. If we were simply engaging in commemoration and in a collective recollection of the, the history of enslavement, uh, of plantations and farms, of the southern economy, and for that matter, the north, northeastern economy as well, prior to uh, um, uh, gradual emancipation, that we would need to, to, to juxtapose the two. We would recognize that enslavement and the, the agricultural and economic and social and political activity that took place within the context of early American life were hand in hand. But what we do have is an insistence on the celebratory connotation of commemoration. And that has its roots in, in, to a great extent in the project of the lost cause. That what we have seen especially in the American South, and, and, and which has been exported from the South. And, and in fact, I, I should offer that the, the beginnings of the Lost Calls were not in the South. They were at the University of Chicago. Um, but that the, the idea of a, a, a sanitization of the Confederacy and its causes um, was a, an intentional project that was pursued in the early 20, late 19th and early 20th centuries and has come to really flavor the way that many people in contemporary American life understand the significance of plantations and understand the character and quality of enslavement. And so we are caught up in that conundrum. Do we commemorate and, 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 and in the course of commemorating that then necessitates a denial. Um, and and th this idea of, of the lost cause, again, is, is a crucial one. Um, we see it rearing its head in the debate about Confederate monuments. Uh, we see it in the conversation about uh, the teaching of American history. Uh, we, we hear it in conversations about how it is that we as Americans come to grips with the contemporary fabric of racism uh, and discrimination, especially against Black Americans. And until we grapple with the, 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 the misdirection and sleight of hand that took place within the context of the Lost Cause Project, we won't be able to come to grips with the, 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 the underpinnings of those realities. The, 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 what we have seen is this notion of the, the gentility of, of, of Southern life. That the plantation was the, uh, um, the, the, the pinnacle of culture, of, of, uh, um, of intellect, of, of sophistication. And that, 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 that veneer had been put forward in order to uh, uh, lead folks to, to, to understand that what took place in the context of the American Civil War and, and secession uh, was, was about uh, um, noble. A, a noble undertaking was, was something that was 
pursued by people of noble character and, 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 and high moral fiber. And, and while there certainly were the trappings of, of, of uh, you know, culture and, and gentility, that, the, that that veneer was only made possible by the brutality and exploitation and subjugation of enslavement. That the, the economic foundations of those lives, of, of that quality of life, depended upon the capacity to control and commodify the bodies, not just the labor, but the very bodies of the enslaved. And we see that over and over again when we look at the economic history of the South and, and see how often uh, folks were forced to uh, um, borrow against their enslaved uh, uh, workers or to sell them off in order to hold on to their land in, in times of economic hardship. So it's, it's quite clear that that was, the, that was a, a, a foundational aspect of the life of the plantation. Uh, and subsequently, when we look at what, what followed, we also recognize that this was all premised upon the, the necessity of, of, of that reality of enslavement. Um, but we, we've romanticized it, we, we've fallen prey to a, uh, a shallow representation of what was, in fact, a, a, a very complex uh, um, and challenging uh, uh, set of, of practices and, 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 and expectations and norms. And I want to close my comments just by, by referencing the, the talking about the consequences of this, the contemporary consequences. And I, you know, I think that will. Um, in, in some ways, sort of foreshadow Kara's point. She's going to talk about the, the ongoing reality that we're still living this. I grew up in South Hampton County here in Virginia. Um, and uh, for those who, who don't know South Hampton, South Hampton County is known really for one thing, and that is that that is where Nat Turner's insurrection started. And South Hampton right now is in the, the throes of a, of, a, of a debate about commemoration and denial. Uh, and it's caught up in the naming of, of, of roads. Uh, there are two roads in Southampton County that trace their history back to the aftermath of Nat Turner's insurrection. Hang Tree Road, because the tree from which they hung Nat at one point was on that street. And so that's commemorated in the name. And also Blackhead Signpost Lane. That one takes a little bit of explanation. Now, so Nat, when Nat and, and, and a number of his co-conspirators, when they were captured, were tried and executed. Nat was hung. Uh, his body was cut into pieces and burned, and the ashes were spread across the county. His co-conspirators were beheaded. And their heads were displayed on signposts. And that is where that road name comes from. That is the historical foundation of that name. And so the, many of the residents of Southampton now are grappling with that reality, grappling with the, 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 the reliving of, of, of that trauma. And I think it's also of note that the conversation about commemoration, to the commemoration of Nat Turner's insurrection, there is no monument to Nat Turner. There is no, no effort to represent Nat Turner as a hero, even though there, those narratives have been put forward. But the, the, the reality is that the folks who are the descendants of Nat Turner and, and the folks in that community who connect their lives and experiences to the story of Turner, they don't see Nat Turner as a heroic figure. They see him as a tra tragic figure. They see him as someone who was driven to horrendous lengths uh, uh, in order to deal with the monstrosity of enslavement. And so at the same time that they maintain a memory, a collective memory of who he was and the significance of what he did for the community, there's no effort to romanticize him. There's no effort to, to, to render him as some noble figure who undertook a noble cause. They understand the enormity of what he did. 
and 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 part of, of, of what we collectively within the community are trying to come to grips with is what that means for all of us. And and so I, I say that to kind of bring it around to this idea of how romanticizing and, and commemorating things that are deeply traumatic result in what uh, Hannah Arendt and Eichmann in Jerusalem referred to as the banality of evil. That these things become commonplace. That we, we know what was underneath them. We know what was happening behind the scene. But we still celebrate them. And in so doing, we render the evil as something that cannot be recognized for what it is. Now, in my comments there. Thank you. Oh, I have to follow that. Okay. <laughs> um, so I think piggyback on what you were saying, this is a continuation of the conversation. It's one of the reasons why my comments are going to be a lot shorter. Because, um, you know, one of the things I realized in my own work and my own research is that I tell people all the time is that we use the word history and it's a little overloaded because we can distance ourselves from the time of the event. But if you if you really look at what's going on now and what happened within it, and that we are still built on the foundation of that system of like the national system, is that we're in the middle of this history of slavery. Um, we are in the midst of the transitioning to freedom chapter of that story, and that means there's a lot of chapters left. We can't even build a system of justice and equality because our infrastructure is not on truth. We have a very shady infrastructure that is crumbling beneath us. And much like the literal infrastructures of a lot of our cities, we consider, you know, we think about it, we just hold off and leave it to the next governor. They'll take care of it. And slowly, you know, the, the roads are crumbling, the bridges are crumbling, and our cities are not surviving. A lot of them are sinking, you know, sinkholes going away. And that same metaphor within the subject of uh, you know, our communities coming together and dealing with the trauma of uh, enslavement in those events. And that is what it is. And so with moving forward, what we have to do is base everything on truth. And when you base everything on truth, you deal with the commemoration in a correct way, in a truthful way, in a righteous way, and you avoid the subject of denial because to deny to disregard the truth. And you can't do that if the basis is the truth. And so in order to do that, we unfortunately have to go back to chapter one. And we have to go back to chapter one because we have to admit that all of the scholarly research we are you know, basing things on now, all of the documentation that we're basing things on now is written during a time where racism, um, you know, prejudices uh, was supported by law, quite literally, and by procedural science that we can look back at now and say that's black science that said that, you know, the Africans were inferior because the heads were shaped by We can look at it now and go, that was preposterous, but that was gospel then, and so many things was built in that infrastructure. So we have to really question everything. And so I spent hours and days you know, that's a word in politics. So I spent hours and days trying to find pamphlets, self-published books, letters, things written by the black people of the time, whether they be free men or recently free men or enslaved folks right after emancipation to get it from their own words because that is something that was ignored. And even up to the period of um, W.E.B. Du Bois, you know, exploring their version of their story and getting all of those sides in order to get to the truth was not considered worthy of scholarship. It was purposely ignored. We're talking about up into what? The 1920s, 1930s? You know, and we see that even within African American history. African American history is transatlantic slave trade. We disappear, Martin Luther King. We disappear again, Obama. You know, so we don't, we don't really get into it, there's a strict avoidance about the subject at all. And so, you know, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, you guys, but we have to go back to square one. So this idea that slavery is history 
you know, I gotta give a lot of sometimes like, no, we are very much in the middle of it. And I would theorize the second chapter of a 20 chapter book. We have so far to go and a lot of work to do. Um, but it can be done. And it, it and it's like Martin Luther King said in his book, Where Do We Go From Here? Is that we also have to get away from the idea is that perfection is a requirement for effort. You know, so just because we can't deliver things perfectly, we can't come to a perfect conclusion doesn't mean we don't try. The other thing we have to realize is that slavery and the racial system of America lasted hundreds of years. We are not going to do it in my generation. We're not going to do it in your generation. We're not going to do it in my 15 year old son's generation. It's going to take some time. But each generation, we do the work, we put forth the effort so that we can build on top of that until we come to the resolution. And if we keep the focus on truth, we will get there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Ponce House. Thank you. Dr. Thorpe. Thank you. Um, as, as Ryan made clear, I'm, I'm a teaching historian. And I've been a historian since I was five years old, but I've been teaching. I wasn't quite that young when I started teaching. But it's it's something that I love doing, and increasingly it's something that I realize even more how much it needs to be done. Um, my wife recently was, was reading um, Ibram Kendi's Stamp from the Beginning, which is uh, definitive, modestly titled The Definitive History of Racism in America. Um, it, and we had some interesting conversations because she thought she she would frequently say, I probably heard this somewhere, maybe when I was in school, but I don't think so. Um, huge sections of America, what to me is is common knowledge, was to my wife virtually unknown. Uh, and this is a woman who educated in one of the best public school systems in, in Maryland, went to the University of Maryland, graduated, and has continued to educate herself ever since. Uh, and yet, doesn't she, she's not been educated and had, had not previously been educated in, in very much of the history of this country. One of the things that, as a historian, to me is just a given, is that in order to understand the present, you have to understand the past. You have to know how we got here to understand why we do what we do, for good or bad. Um, I mean, think, things of my generation, you know, the, the War Powers Act only makes sense if you understand the Vietnam War. Uh, campaign, campaign reform only makes sense if you understand what Richard Nixon was up to. Further back, um, trying to understand the 14th Amendment. You know, why, is the, why was the 14th Amendment written the way it was? Well, you have to understand the Dred Scott decision. And you have to understand all of the legislation and activities before that. So history is not, this is what drives me crazy about my students sometimes. They, they come in thinking history is memorizing dates, which is the least important part of what we do. Um, understanding history is understanding the world in, in which we live. And that's, that's the, the base where I start. And in, situ, in issues whether it's the Confederacy, slavery, any number of other things. Um, what I think we have to do in this era is to recognize what came before and to acknowledge the debt that not, not we as individuals, but the debt that we as a nation owe to generations of enslaved African workers. I, just, I want to distinguish personal recognition from, from, from national. Um, I said this as a Southerner. Um, my family owned slaves. And I recognize every day that I, I have benefited from that. Um, my family was able, after the, the Civil War, to get off the farm, go into town, and become lawyers and doctors, and, and eventually college professors. Um, that's my personal obligation. But as a nation, we have a similar obligation. Look at the US Capitol. It was built by slave labor. 
The White House was built with slave labor. Here in the southern United States, virtually any university, college worthy of its name was based on wealth derived from slave labor. Um, I'm, a, I'm a graduate of Davidson College in North Carolina. It was paid for in Ireland uh, with money raised by enslaved, from people who had gotten it from their enslaved workers. Uh, the, the foundation of this nation was laid by enslaved workers. And I'm not, I don't expect the United States to suddenly feel guilty and feel like they have to destroy everything that was, was built that way. But as a nation, we have to recognize the, where our wealth came from, where, where the foundation, not just our financial wealth, um, as Ryan was mentioning, the fact that people like Thomas Jefferson and George Washington or James Madison could devote time to thinking heavy thoughts like the Constitution was because somebody else was doing the work and paying the bills. The, the intellectual, the cultural, the political, virtually everything about this nation ultimately rests on a foundation that was built by enslaved workers. And again, I, I don't want the nation to go into a deep sense of guilt about that and start tearing things apart. But I do think that we need to acknowledge that debt, uh, that what we have, what we as a people have derived from it, and what we as a people owe to the descendants and of, of those that, that worked so hard to make this country. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Thorpe. So at this point, we will uh, turn it over to you, the audience, uh, for questions. So if you want to submit a question, just type it in the comment section. And I'm not checking email or text or anything like that, but this is where I'm going to uh, get those uh, questions. So we'll, uh, we'll take as many as we can. And uh, if you want to address a comment specifically to one panelist or in general, just let us know. And while we wait, is there is there any follow up to that? I think um, Dr. Thorpe and, uh, and Dr. Mosley Hobbs, I think you followed up uh, really really well uh, from Dr. Graves' segments here. Is there anything that you'd like to add, Dr. Graves? I, I really like the uh, the, 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 the premise of a transition of freedom. I mean, to me, because we, we we've been so fixated on this idea that slavery was over. And, and yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's over. It's done. And, and this idea, this notion of a transition to freedom is a much more nuanced way of, of making sense of what that process that we're still undertaking yeah. looks like. Yeah. And, and to not make it so, so you know, so, so incredibly simplistic and as to say that it just it's done. Yeah. And you're absolutely right about appearing and vanishing, appearing and um, one of one of you know, I, I regularly look at textbooks to decide which ones to use in my in my history classes. And yeah, uh, the same thing is true of Native Americans. Um, they're there for George Custer, and then they vanish. Yeah. Uh, and then they might pop up once in 1844 to get citizenship, and then they vanish. Yeah. Um, African Americans are they come in in 1619. Um, they have some rebellions, and then they're they're free. And then oh, there's this guy named Martin Luther King, yeah. and then that's about it. Yeah. You know where a lot of those those empty periods come from? It, it comes from um, the systematic racism of, in, of ignoring um, the works and the scholarships, the opinions, the thoughts and ideas, or the very existence of the black community during that time. So, you know, there's so many different works I've come across. Like, have you ever heard of David Walker? David Walker in the 1830s wrote this. Yeah, he's a he's a Freeman, he was born into freedom, and he eventually moves to Boston, Massachusetts, because not because it's better up there, but the 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 uh, to stay alive. Yeah, <laughs> the statistical possibilities were better in Boston, Massachusetts. He went from 90% chance of being caught in so does slavery as a freeman to 60% chance. So statistically, it was better. But you know, I didn't know that he wrote this. You know. I'm going to call it a book for, you know, for modern last term, but he wrote a book that was a response to Thomas Jefferson's The State of Virginia. Mm -hmm. And it's basically a book geared towards, um, you know, the enslaved people and the black people of the time. So when I read this, the first thing I thought was, 
you know, he it was it was well written, first of all. And then the second thing I thought was, you're taught that so many when slaves could read that they were just uneducated. And so now I have the question, if so little enslaved could read, why would a freedman think he could write something targeted to these people? So now I have to question those numbers like, okay, I'm not saying that all of the enslaved individuals on the plantation could read, but there's a high possibility that there was a basic knowledge of it because you're around it, especially for um, you know, the women who are raising the children, when they're learning to read and playing with the blocks, we think they're not going to pick up the same information, you know. And so there's at least, you know, a handful or, or you know, one or two people on the plantation that probably can read that can get the information and then meet up later on, whether, you know, get the Mary Tree or Smith, you know, say, look, so they were all saying <laughs> that they call themselves Christians, but they're not really Christians. And here's why, you know, and have those type of conversations. And we can't really fill in the blanks with that um, because it's it's been that denial part of it of saying that you know those thoughts, those theories, that scholarship, that philosophy didn't exist. They woke up, they worked, they went to sleep. <laughs> and every once in a while, you know, depending on who you act, every once in a while, it might have been a woman or a mention, but for the most part, most of the same You know, and so it's, it's, it's you know the, the idea of so so. You know, I say to everyone, when you go for it and you really start researching and exploring, question everything. Because we are at the period where we're realizing that they, it's not a basis of truth. And so I'm not going to say that something that um, uh, a slave owner or a white person wrote directly is not correct. I'm just saying that you should really question everything. Mm -hmm. so. That's really good. Thank you for the continued conversation. We do have a couple of questions. And the first question is to the whole panel. Um, what are some of the best concrete steps you suggest we take as individuals to take the nation forward for better unity? Okay, if, if, the, if the goal is unity, and I think this is a really, because we, we, we frequently hear the term that, that something is divisive. And, and, and to be honest, as, as a black man, as an African American, much of what I hear when I hear someone use the term, you can make reference to something as, as divisive, is that it undercuts white domination. That that in, in many instances, what, what people see as a basis for unity is conformity to the norms and expectations that white Americans have defined for everyone, rather than all of us collectively coming together and defining with one another, how our society will, will, will go forward. So I would say if the goal is unity, the concrete step to take is to not uh, 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 identify efforts on the part of marginalized groups to achieve equity in our society as a source of division. Because what they are calling for is unity. They are saying we seek to be at the table, we seek to be in the conversation, we seek to have a voice in the discussion of what we are and what we should be. So that, that to me is, the, is, is how to move towards unity. Recognize and, and believe, you know, and to, to stop the gaslighting, stop the dismissal and the denial of the experiences of people who are crying out to be heard. Listen to them and believe them. Collectively, you don't have to believe, you know, this story or this story. Individuals can falsify, but if if you can see that there is an arc, a narrative arc, in in, in what it is that people are articulating, then that 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 that, that, that crosses the board. There's there's truth to that. That that, that they're not all making that up. And I think that's been, been a, a really fundamental issue for me for a long time. Thank you. Would another panelist like to answer? I, I guess I, I, what came to mind was more of a, a different sort of response based on my own experiences. Um, I mean, one of the things that was most difficult for me in some of the research I've done in the past 10 years is getting to know members of Montgomery County's African-American community. And one of the things 
I'm not a regular churchgoer, so for me it was it was difficult for two ways, but to start attending black church services um, as a way of gaining insight into a community that is radically different from my own. Um, and I think that's really what we need is mutual understanding, not screaming at one another, um, but you know, actually listen to the other side and go outside your comfort zone. Go, go, go to something that maybe you're not comfortable with that is a fundamental part of another culture and, and see what their world looks like. And I think that's something that historic sites like Smithfield can do. They can offer a, a place where people can hopefully step outside of their comfort zones and feel comfortable enough maybe to engage an idea that is different from their own narrative and hopefully see the world from another person's perspective. And I think that's, that's another thing that we can do to help build unity is to come to a place like Smithfield and other historic sites that are, that are trying to grapple with these questions and try to see the world from, from another person. Yeah. Uh, person's perspective. Yeah, the only thing I would add to, to both of their comments was um, I think to deal with what Dr. Ellison was saying, the difference between diversity and assimilation, mm -hmm. essentially is what he's saying. Mm -hmm. um, and then what uh, Dr. Thorpe was saying, which was experiential learning, mm -hmm. um, which mm -hmm. is kind of there and, and um, you know, see some, some things that you've never seen before, has new experiences. Uh, both of those things are possible if you. Um, address your trauma mm -hmm. and just recognize that you have some trauma that limits you from doing those two things. You get limited from doing without the door of suggestion because you have some irrational fears. Mm -hmm. So figure out what is so scary about the black church, <laughs> you know, um, what is so scary about the black neighborhoods? What is so scary about, mm -hmm. you know, that whole experience in international? Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm not saying that you suddenly get over it, is you find an ally in the African American community that can help you get those experiences until you can work through that trauma. And for African American people, it's the same thing. You know, um, it's the anger that you're feeling irrational, it's the fear that you're feeling irrational and kind of getting those things. Because it's two different traumas that require two different needs. Um, you know, a lot of people have, we have been taught to assimilate, we have been taught to perform. Um, our entire lives. And even in government, I have co-workers who will pull me aside and ask me how I can still be black in that environment. Um, how I can still be authentically myself because they can't control not turning off their blackness in that environment. Like they can't even figure out how to do it. And you know, I walk in a meeting and somebody saying something crazy, I will sip my tea. And then you know, and then that means something. So like the black community, when you sip your tea, and I'm gonna be the one time, and I'm like, mm, sip the tea, and the, the black guy across the table spit his tea. <laughs> because he understood what I was doing, but he was in the middle of his performance, you know what I mean? And so it's it's really addressing your trauma to be able to, you know, get through the difference between diversity and simulation and getting through experiential learning and getting out there and trying. That's really good. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question uh, from somebody who's currently taking a class on uh, George Floyd. And the question is, sorry, um, how can I, as a white woman, understand how events led to that moment, meaning George Floyd? I am sad with the idea that anyone can own anyone because of the color of their skin. I don't want to be ignorant. I want knowledge. I mean, I, I, I answer first and last. I mean, I well, anti-blackness is, is built into uh, is it built into this country, and so it's not necessarily just um, uh, the color of skin. It's the color of skin. It's the feature of the Negroid, as the the historical texts say, and it's association with blackness also. Um, and so, you know, one of the things with dealing with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, um, you know, we're unfortunate with the outcome of that situation is, you know, really to look at it for what it is. And it's just a, a strict, simple anti-blackness. Um, and so the only way to be, you know, to, to fight anti-blackness is 
to make an effort, I think, to, and I don't want to use the word pro-black, because if I say pro-black, people are thinking of like, who, 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 I don't support systems of anti-blackness. There is some action that has to happen. And like I said at the beginning of this, where we're at the very infancy stage of dealing with this, I don't even have the answer to that yet. Uh, but I do know it's small steps. There's not going to be anything that anyone at this panel can say to that, you know, viewer. Uh, read these three books, take this therapy, drink green tea. Put some turmeric and some ginger in it, and you'll feel better in the morning. You know, it's 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 going to take some time and some effort to do it. And so, um, I think with them, what they were talking about earlier about you know getting different experiences and, and letting um, diversity come into the room without required simulation will really help. Thank you. And and probably some strategic amnesia. I mean, I think many of us have to unlearn what we were told as children. Uh, the public education systems, but just what we learned growing up, growing up in the house, the, the way that our parents behaved unconsciously mm -hmm. led to almost inbred notions that you now have to stop and say, wait a minute, the way you said, Kira, why do I, what, what am I afraid of? Why do I, why do I think what I think? Why do I believe what I believe? You know, is there actually any reason for my fears or for my concern or for my resentment? Um, and I say, perhaps not just not just reading three books and drinking green tea, but then forgetting half of what you've already learned. Yeah. And, and I'll add, you know, I, I've, I've had I've had the conversation a few times over um, my life with with white friends about. How they see me, and are you one of the good ones? Uh, well, oh, oh, I'm, I'm not one of them. I mean, I'm, <laughs> well, you know, I don't even see you as a as a, as a black man. Like, and, and the conversation I had was, do you believe that knowing me brings something meaningful into your life? And you know, they, they answer yes. And my response is, well, that that thing that I bring to you to your life. That's inseparable from them, but from day one. Mm -hmm. I am who I am mm -hmm. because I have I have experienced life as someone who is racialized as black, as male, as straight, as cis. I mean, all of those have contributed to me being who I am. So, but but what 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 what? And this this is where the anti-blackness comes in. It, that there is this sense that the only way that they can appreciate me as bringing something of value is to separate me from my blackness. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that's a key piece is, you know, the, 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 the effort to erase blackness mm -hmm. is a manifestation of anti blackness. Yeah. Yeah. As, a, as a fair skinned woman, anything about me visually that, that people find pretty is what is you mix with? What do you mix with? Because it can't be in the African part of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is nothing. Do not get a Um I have here a question, and this is this is one that I'll probably try to answer at some point, but I'll throw it out to to the panel first. Um, this person says, "I am a trained architect and find beauty in old homes, but I don't think beauty is worth the pain in my cause, African Americans, when they are reminded of the pain of the past." I really enjoy, for instance, Smithfield Tea in concerts at Christmas time, but is this too celebratory in the use of the property? Oh, I can answer that one. <laughs> okay, so I, sh I actually struggle with that statement. Um, and I haven't figured out if that's a traumatic response or if it's a reasonable response to it. So my method right now is not, especially as a member of the board, to try to get Smithfield to stop doing that. Um, and that's separate from the idea of weddings. Weddings seem a little weird to me, but but that, I think that might be a little bit more trauma than anything else. Um, but I don't want to not acknowledge European culture here because it has been. 
So right now, my, my idea or my ideology or my theory or my method is that Smithfield needs to do more to also commemorate and recognize mm -hmm. the African and African-American culture that has here. And I'm hoping that once that balance happens, um, that it won't look like it is being ignored or denied. It will look like it's just a celebration of the community that was here. And that, that includes um, addressing and being very honest about the brutality of slavery. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, one of the things I'm most excited about coming up that we're planning, you know, with Virginia Tech and Smithfield and everything is uh, something that commemorates or acknowledges the Mary Tree and the space and what it represented for the Native community, the European community, um, and the African community. You know, it's well known that the Mary Tree is predominantly for the enslaved community. Uh, and then what that celebration is going to look like. And the next couple of things that we've done here at Smithfield, the subject of the enslaved community, uh, like when we bring the traveling exhibit down of, of African artifacts, it draws a crowd. So there's at least a hunger there of more um, than, you know, just the acknowledgement that here's the winter kitchen, <laughs> you know, here's the summer kitchen. Sure. Um, and so we're definitely working on that. So I wouldn't say to avoid, you know, um, uh, Susan and Preston's tea or anything like that, but I will pay attention to the new program that we're having coming up and then use that as, as an opportunity to um, learn and experience some other things. That's, that's good. And, and I certainly, I love, I love classical architecture as well. And it's not just places like Smithfield. I mean, you have to you have to have the same attitude towards anything built in ancient Rome or Greece. That again, I, I acknowledge who built it, acknowledge conditions under which they built it, and then admire the beauty they created. I mean, it, it's I, I still hope we can manage that. Yeah. No, I, I think you covered it. And as a, as a practitioner of uh, public history, um, I often will come across people who have a fear that if we talk more about one subject, then we're going to ignore another. Mm -hmm. and, and humans are infinitely complex. And that's one of the most fascinating things about studying history is that it's all about complicated people. Mm -hmm. And the, the family, the, the Preston family that lived here were just as complicated as any family that we might have grown up in, in their dynamics and, and their, their ancestry and everything that comes into the way that house felt. And I, I think I think here at, at Smithfield, we, we need to make sure we embrace the, the whole story and, and not be afraid uh, that when we talk more about the indigenous peoples that were here before there were Prestons, or when we talk about the Fraction family, that somehow we're taking away from the fact that Colonel William Preston was one of the signers of the Fincastle Resolutions, which influenced the Declaration of Independence. Both happened at the same time. And, and, and that, that's the same thing if I, if I look at myself. I'll also use myself as an analogy. There are things about Ryan that I like. And if somebody were to write a biography about Ryan at some point, God forbid, there are going to be some things that I'm really embarrassed about. Too. <laughs> I mean, it's, just, it's just the reality of things. I mean, we, we, have to, we have to be um, honest and as inclusive as possible. We're not trying to revise history, I don't think. We're trying to tell a fuller and more complete history. And that's what we've been trying to do at Smithfield, increments. And there, there's been so much work from people over the years trying, trying to bring this up. But we're, we're really pushing uh, the effort now to, to try to bring these narratives so that they are in line with the narratives of the Preston family who are here. Because this is as much their property as it is the Preston's, and we have to tell that story in the same breath. And I don't think one cancels the other. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's anything. Um, we do have some more some more questions, which is great that they keep coming in. So this is in the context of um, Plato's Republic, discussing the use of his the use of uh, a slave. Uh, slavery is perfectly normal part of Athenian life. How do we try to understand our founding fathers who offered true genius in founding documents, but could not bring themselves to confront the horror of slavery because it always existed? 
Well, I mean, I think the, the point you just made is, is, is crucial is to, I mean, we, we get caught up, and again, it's, it's about commemoration, it's about the celebratory uh, uh, impulse that we have to have these folks who we put on a pedestal, who we hold up as, as icons. And, and the reality is that they were, you know, they were deeply flawed. They were smart. They're clearly smart, clearly capable of great depth of thought. But they were sexist, racist, classes. Uh, you know, they, 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 they were intolerant individuals. They did not like people who were unlike themselves and, and, and rationalized that in incredibly powerful ways that created flaws in the institutions that they built and in the ideas that they articulated. And part of what we've got to do, even as we want to hold on to those ideas, is to understand how the flaws of the individuals impacted the way that they got put forward. Mm -hmm. and, and, and recognize that it's our job now to, to wrestle with that, to, to you know, the, the, the notion of, of the brilliance of the Constitution is, you know, its, it's capacity to, to be adaptive. Well, let's adapt. <laughs> you know, let, let's let's stop with this notion. We've got to hold on to the vision of the founders. Dear God, no! <laughs> because that vision was 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 a vision of, of, of men who were profoundly flawed. Um, and 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 that doesn't mean that we can't celebrate the good things. We can't celebrate those those, those, those ideals that they that they put forward. But but to recognize that's that they're not the same thing, and I think that's that's a tendency that Americans have. And it should also keep us humble that 300 years from now, people will look, people will look back yes. on us and say, "How the hell could they believe that?" Yes. 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 Yeah, we're, we're, we we think we have all the answers, yes. uh, and our our descendants will laugh that God, they were ignorant. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll make this, this additional point. I, I find myself constantly, I, I teach classes on, on inequality, and I, I find myself constantly to, you know, just telling students when this comes up, it's like, look, I'm a man. Sexism has been a part of the fabric of my experience, of my frame of reference. And I, every, every day, I find myself catching myself in that. When I, when I, when I, you know, I, I just, you know, a, a, a thought passes through my head, or, or you know, I begin to move, take, take some action. Like, wait, stop! Think about it. Be intentional. Be self-aware. I often end up in situations like this. Mm -hmm. Are the only lady? You know, that's, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's very common. And so, you know, I joke around sometimes, but I always, always think like I'm at the bottom, bottom of the total pole. I'm black and I'm female, so I'm way, way, way at the bottom. Um, but I think the answer to that question about you know Athenians and racism it, it goes back to question everything in the trash of trauma. That I mean the way the question is phrased is a very westernized point of view, first of all. Um, if you go read uh, like David Walker, he actually answers and addresses that in his writing when he was answering Thomas Jefferson. And then there's a, a writer from the early 1800s. He was enslaved in England, and he gained his freedom and wrote his story. And he addresses that also. And he said, slavery in West Africa was not reversion. We use the same word, but it was not the same infrastructure and institution. And so you have to question, like, using the same word does not automatically mean the same translation of things. Uh, the next question, I think, follows Dr. Thorpe's um, previous statement really well. And the question just reads, how do we get all people on all sides of the debate to accept that our ancestors were people of their time and deserve to be judged by the standards of their time? If we don't approach them in that fashion, don't we risk delegitimizing the judgments we make of them? Yes, but. <laughs> um, because it, it, certainly it's true that they were men of their time. But there were also other men of that time with very different ideas. Um, the, I mean, most, most significantly, the, most of the Quaker Church. Uh, by the mid-18th century, the Quaker Church had taken 
a fairly clear stand against slavery. Um, not all of them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it is important to understand that worldviews have changed, whether it's about um, racism or about the germ theory of disease or about is the earth flat. It, yes, there, there is something to be said that they were a, a person of their era. But it's also important to realize that there were others in those eras that, that thought differently. Uh, and to recognize that, that as Ellington was saying, not a, there's a whole range of experiences, a whole range of people uh, in any historical era, including our own. Uh, and hopefully those who look back on us in the future will, will feel that way towards us. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I would also add that the, that the, con the notion of racial inferiority that was the underpinning of enslavement was not that that's not an idea that's always been around earlier human beings they took note of phenotypic difference they recognized that people looked differently but they did not engage in the blanket categorization of races that came to be the underpinning of the transatlantic slave trade and the subsequent systems that were created so if you go back, if you want to go back to ancient Greece, they they, they certainly saw they were that they, they they believed that there were Africans who were inferior to them, but they also believed that there were Africans who were their equals, based upon the characteristics of their culture and civilization, and whether they could find parallels in terms of how people live. I mean, they, they certainly there, there were you know real issues in some of those uh, characterizations as well. But my point is to, for folks to understand this notion that they were products of their time, these ideas came about so as to justify a system that they were fundamentally committed to and invested in. And, and that's what you see when you see Jefferson wrestling with, with, with his ideas in Notes on the State of Virginia. Uh, where he's talking about it, you know, he would like to believe that his Negro brethren were his equal, but he just simply could not come to that conclusion. And that's a product of that kind of rationalization. And it's also, you also have to distinguish between the two ideas that even if Jefferson did from time to time articulate opposition to the institution of slavery, he still yes. believed that Africans and African Americans were simply inferior. And that oh, the problem for Jefferson, the problem was, okay, if we abolish slavery, what do we do with all you guys? Because we can't ship you back to Africa, but we clearly can't live with you. And so this is a dilemma. The, the lesser of two evils is, I'm just going to keep you as a slave. Um, so yeah, the, the, one of, the, one of, the, one of the, the misconceptions many Americans continue to have is that if you're an abolitionist, you're anti-racist. No. <laughs> Uh, many of the abolitionists were totally racist. They just didn't believe in slavery. Uh, they're, they're two separate things, and each, yeah. each was independently equal. And, and in fact, many of them, their opposition to slavery was because of the consequences of the system for white people. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and for more on that topic, we have a great article in the Smithfield Review, issue uh, 24. <laughs> uh, I highly recommend that you uh, get that and read it if you haven't already. Um, we are um, at the time we've got about two minutes. Uh, so, Dr. Mosley Hobbs, if you had anything else to add to that one? Um, nope, I'm thinking. Okay. okay, well, um, does anyone on our panel have any parting thoughts? I'd just like to thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, it was a really nice conversation. And I'd like to thank the audience for, 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 for sticking around. Mm. Absolutely. Um, this, I think, is one of the things that we need to do in order to move forward mm -hmm. and gain empathy and understanding. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you to the audience. We hope that in the future we have more discussions, maybe not always as heavy as this one, um, but we want to use uh, Smithfield as the canvas or the, the platform for talking about modern topics. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And uh, from uh, Blacksburg, we uh, wish you very well. Thank you.